A lot of people have been asking if we're planning to cover the Messier objects in order from 1 to 110. And the answer to that is no, we're not. We're going to do them in a bit of a random order, but we are starting with M1. That's the Crab Nebula. And although Messier didn't realise this when he catalogued it first, it's actually perhaps one of the most amazing objects on the list. And it's one of the very few objects in space which popped into existence in front of human eyes. Although, popped into existence probably isn't the best choice of words. We are in the library of the Royal Society here in London, where the archivist has been kind enough to dig out some astronomically related treasures for our video series. So the book I have in front of me is a book of photographs of astronomical objects by the late 19th century astronomer Isaac Roberts. And if I turn to this particular page, we will find a familiar object. So to begin at the beginning, yes, M1 was the first of the objects that Messier stumbled across pretty much by chance when he was tracking a comet and put into his catalogue of things which you don't want to mistake for comets. What are we going to do? Uh, I'm going to have a look at M1, which is the, the Crab Nebula. Um, I'm going to slew the telescope onto it and we'll see how it looks. It's the after effect of a stellar explosion. A, a 10 sun mass star about a thousand years ago exploded and produced this beautiful supernova remnant. The explosion from the star which produced a supernova has made a real kind of splash in its local bit of the Milky Way. And so it's really churned up the gas. It's really caused a real fuss, basically. There's lots of gas around it. It's really mixed it up and then left behind this beautiful supernova remnant. 1054, I think, is the date. And the reason we're pretty certain of the date is because the Chinese astronomers at the time were keeping pretty accurate records. And uh, so it's a, a recorded, what was then called a guest star, something which appeared briefly in the sky. Uh, it was so bright that it was visible during the day for several, several days, um, and then was visible you know, to the naked eye for several years after that. So it's clearly a pretty impressive thing, uh, and got recorded by the Chinese and also by various other astronomers around the world as well. So it's a pretty well-documented event. We have got some challenges tonight, you think? Well, it's very low in the sky at the moment, so um, and we're very close to the moon. So the first thing we need to do is we'll just take a 10 second exposure. Yeah, there it is. So that's the Crab Nebula. It looks uh, a bit uninspiring at this point because it's just a single 10 second exposure. To image this properly, we'd normally have to take at least two or three hours worth of exposure through this filter. So it's not gonna be a particularly good image. It's a very rewarding target because it's uh, such an interesting object. Hopefully with two minutes it will show a little bit more of the structure that actually gave it its name, the Crab Nebula. And that name goes back to Lord Ross who made some sketches of it based on his observations in the 19th century. And what he was really seeing, the reason why it ends up being called the Crab Nebula, is it has these sort of little filaments sticking out the sides which clearly look a little bit like legs. And so again, it's one of these things, it takes a bit of imagination to really see it as a crab, but it's some sort of shape with little bits sticking out the edges. What we see here is essentially a fuzzy blob. We are used to seeing crisp, detailed pictures of this really spectacular object, but here we see what it looked like to astronomers of the day, and they didn't know what it was. And it took till much later until we actually uncovered the truth of what this object represented. The reason it's so bright is that the outer layers of the star have been blown out into space at incredibly high speeds, something like 10% of the speed of light. That's a lot of energy that gets put out into the immediate environment. The gas gets heated up, and then because it's so hot, it gets heated up to millions of degrees, and then it takes thousands of years to cool down again. And so it's cooling down, but it's cooling down at a really low rate. What we're doing at this point is just uh, waiting for this two minute exposure to complete. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just see some of that coming through now. What you see here, this is a single two minute exposure. It's still a snapshot in terms of a, a proper deep sky image. That would last several hours to do that. But this is a, an image of the Crab Nebula taken with a hydrogen alpha filter. And this is recording red light effectively. As the star exploded as a supernova, this material is sort of thrown into space and we see this expanding uh, nebula. Mostly what happens when a supernova blows up is that you end up blowing the outer layers of the star out into space. 
Um, and this is a sufficiently young remnant that mostly what you're seeing are actually those outer layers of the star. You're seeing the bits of the star that are all blown off in the explosion. And so the outer layers of a star, even at the end of its life, are mostly hydrogen and helium. But it's actually one of the mysteries of this object that there's not enough stuff there. If you actually count up how much mass there is, there's about two or three solar masses worth of stuff around it. And then there's a remnant left in the middle, which is another couple of solar masses. So that adds up to about five times the mass of the sun. But it's thought that the star that blew up probably had a mass of around 10 or 11 times the mass of the sun. And probably what happens is before the star blew up as a supernova, it was actually throwing out quite a lot of material in a very sort of dense stellar wind. So a lot of material, maybe four or five solar masses, was blown out into space. And we haven't yet seen that material. Eventually, when this remnant expands enough, it'll start lighting up that material that was thrown out into space. The one that exploded is this one here, the lower right of the two that we see in the centre of the nebula itself. And it's a very interesting structure going on around here because this is a, a pulsar. It's only about 10 miles in diameter. It's rotating at 33 times a second and it's so dense, it has, it has the same density as a, a, a neutron effectively. So imagine taking the sun which has got a mass a bit like the mass of a pulsar or a neutron star and kind of squishing it down to the size of a city. So it's incredibly dense. It's denser than the nucleus of an atom, this material. So very, very bizarre material, but then it's rotating incredibly rapidly and has this very strong magnetic field associated with it. Say a sugar lump. A sugar lump of neutron star stuff, if you put, had, had some weighing scales, it would weigh pretty much the same as entire humanity. Seven billion people on one side and a sugar lump of neutron star stuff on the other side have about the same mass. Growing up and reading about the Crab Nebula in the old astronomy books, it was stated that astronomers could see changes within the Crab Nebula over a period of 10 years. Now, in astronomy, that's actually very, very fast. It was an early project of mine to actually take a, a very short two-frame movie consisting of two images of the Crab Nebula taken over a period of four months to see whether there would be any structural changes around the pulsar. And I've set the movie up so it's effectively just blinking backwards and forwards between the two. And if you look carefully at the middle, you can see, although the orientation is slightly different here, this right-hand star now is the pulsar. And if you look just above there and below there, you can see physical changes in the nebula. We're seeing these shock waves moving away from the pulsar. It looks like they're bouncing backwards and forwards, but in reality, because it's just a two-frame move, we're just jumping from frame to frame. But if we were to take a sequence of images over perhaps a year or something like that, we'd see these shock waves moving out away from the pulsar. These supernova remnants go through various phases in their life. Firstly, they, they start expanding fairly freely, then they start ploughing into all the interstellar medium around them, and then slowly they kind of fade away to nothingness. In 10, 20, 30,000 years time, it's going to really fade away to nothing very much. The thing about supernovae is that they're a bit like buses. They kind of wait for a few hundred years and then come along, come along all at once. And so we're kind of long overdue for another nearby supernova in the Milky Way. You know, it could, be, it could happen tomorrow. Um, we've had to wait about 300 years for an optical supernova uh, to go off in the Milky Way. But then there were about three of them happened around about 1600. So we're kind of long overdue for another one. So it could be that anytime soon, we're going to get another supernova go off. It'll be incredibly bright because it's so close. And then as we follow the after effects of that supernova explosion, we'll end up producing something like the crab. The fact that it's a fuzzy blob is important because that's why it's in the Messier catalogue. Messier wanted to look for comets. He didn't want to get distracted by all these other objects that looked like comets but weren't. So that's why he made a catalogue. And this is the first object in his catalogue. Of course, when we think about comets, we're used to thinking of these big, glorious objects that streak halfway across the sky in photographs. But that's a comet seen when it approaches closely to the sun, and its tail streams out by the solar wind. But most of the time, these objects are really known as dirty snowballs. They're collections of ice and dirt, and they're not very bright. In fact, they're quite dim. And so before they reach the sun on their orbital journey, they really look quite unspectacular. And that's why a photograph like this, an object like this, would easily be mistaken for a comet by dedicated comet hunters of the day. So this is the MAGIC telescope at La Palma. This is detecting gamma rays from space. It doesn't detect the gamma rays directly. It actually detects radiation that the gamma rays create in the atmosphere. But it also ties in nicely with Messier 1, because Eduardo, who works here, was telling me 
M1 is a very important standard candle for the magic telescopes. They use it sometimes to calibrate these telescopes because M1 is one of the most reliable nearby sources of gamma rays. So when they're calibrating something, testing a new instrument, they're wanting to check that everything's working well, they want to point these telescopes at a good reliable source of gamma rays. M1 is perfect. And depending on the settings and the frequencies that they're measuring at, they can sometimes detect a gamma ray every second or a gamma ray every hour. So there you go, M1, not only an amazing thing, but also a very handy thing in space that we can use to calibrate instruments.